Greetings everyone and welcome back. I'm thrilled to share that I've recently acquired a new dress for an upcoming visit to Ascot to meet a friend. We're planning a marvelous party complete with a live screening on a large screen, an event that promises to be truly epic. However, amid my excitement, I've received inquiries from individuals questioning why I'm not in London amidst the bustling action. Allow me to elaborate on my choice. The allure of enjoying this moment from the comfort of my own space, with access to a personalized bar service and a magnificent screen, outweighs the prospect of being in a crowded London scene. Allow me to recount an experience from years past at a Fat Boy Slim concert, relocated from the expansive Brighton Beach to the narrow and lengthy Madeira Drive. Unfortunately, my friend and I found ourselves caught in a brief but distressing 60-second crowd crush. Since then, being amidst a large crowd triggers my panic attacks, making such gatherings unsuitable for me. Hence, I prefer the solace of my own space. Regarding London, the city is currently bustling with tourists from across the globe, all flocking to witness this historical moment. Among the numerous attractions drawing attention, the abundance of military uniforms is capturing the excitement of many, including both women and men. These uniforms grace train stations, the underground tubes, and various locations as the military personnel prepare for the upcoming band processions and rehearsals. Some of these rehearsals commence at dawn when the streets are tranquil, allowing for concentrated practice sessions. Those fortunate enough to be awake at such early hours have captured breathtaking photographs, underscoring the sheer scale of what's in store for Saturday. Amidst my anticipation, I have grown increasingly frustrated with certain media narratives that seem fixated on painting a gloomy picture, emphasizing cancellations or controversies. My stance remains firm. Give the event a chance before forming opinions. If it doesn't resonate with you, a mere 10 minutes might suffice to make that determination. I refuse to lend credence to most of these stories, particularly those speculating on Catherine, the future queen, potentially foregoing a tiara in favor of adorning her hair with flowers, reminiscent of a Seventi style. Irrespective of her choice, Catherine could carry any attire with grace and charm, yet the gossip persists. As I eagerly await the unfolding events, let's delve into a heartwarming snippet making rounds on social media. The King Charles Instagram account featured a delightful throwback clip, showcasing a young Prince Charles and Princess Anne during their mother's coronation. Witnessing these royal siblings frolicking tugging at the Queen Mother's robes embodies the innocence and joy of childhood, a reminder that regardless of status, children remain children, embracing moments of levity even on the most solemn occasions. However, amidst the anticipation and cheer, a concerning incident transpired outside Buckingham Palace. A man was detained under the Mental Health Act for hurling shotgun cartridges within the palace grounds prompting controlled explosions by the authorities to neutralize the situation. The individual apprehended happened to be Jacob Rees-Mogg, an esteemed member of Parliament. Remarkably, a live broadcast captured the quintessentially British response to adversity, maintaining composure and carrying on with the proceedings, seemingly unfazed by the disruption. This display of fortitude and calmness was witnessed live on GB News, while many, like myself, caught wind of the incident later on social media platforms. It's intriguing how amidst potential chaos, the Brits showcased their trademark resolve with a touch of humor as captured in a shared photograph that brought a chuckle, a snapshot of the intruder attempting to cause disturbance at Buckingham Palace. Presently, numerous interviews have been broadcasted, capturing attention. Notably, Princess Anne participated in a 30-minute interview with Canadian broadcaster CBBC alongside Adrian Arsenault. Her demeanor, praised for its blend of humor and no-nonsense approach, is often likened to a combination of her late father, Prince Philip, and the former queen. While I haven't had the chance to view the entire interview, glimpses revealed Princess Anne raising the topic of slavery, expressing doubts regarding its recent exploration by Charles, who agreed to investigate potential links between the monarchy and this historical atrocity. Undoubtedly, Charles' willingness to address this issue is understandable. However, it's evident that merely fulfilling these demands won't assuage those vehemently advocating for action. The issue isn't solely about rectifying past wrongs. 
It's a perpetual cycle where demands persist despite acknowledging the dark stain slavery left on history. Overlooking the UK's significant efforts in abolishing slavery, including the 1807 Act led by William Wilberforce, diminishes the broader context. The UK's establishment of the West Africa Squadron in 1808 to protect Africa's coastline from slave ships highlights the nation's proactive stance against this abhorrent practice. Criticism, notably from certain quarters in America, seems disproportionately directed towards the UK without considering historical timelines. The US, for instance, abolished slavery much later in 1865. Charles, in an attempt to address this narrative, could potentially fund an extensive documentary, collaborating with historians worldwide to illustrate the UK's pivotal role in eradicating slavery. Nonetheless, it's apparent that satisfying these demands might remain elusive, given the incessant nature of such demands in today's society. Another pertinent point raised by Princess Anne was the rationalization behind Charles' efforts to streamline the number of working senior royals. This strategic move, aimed at reducing the privileges enjoyed by numerous members of the royal family, garners widespread approval from the public. Charles has initiated measures such as relocating individuals from larger residences and downsizing, reflecting an effort to modernize the monarchy. However, this effort encounters a hurdle concerning the insufficient presence of active senior royals involved in patronages and charities. The Queen and Prince Philip previously held over a thousand patronages collectively, whereas the current cohort of working royals falls short in maintaining this level of engagement. The imminent retirement of senior royals, including Princess Anne and others aged between 72 and 87, signals a need for succession planning. When William and Catherine assume greater responsibilities, the shortage of actively engaged royals becomes a concern. From a taxpayer's perspective, supporting a large number of multimillionaire royal family members in their luxurious lifestyles seems unjustifiable. However, the primary concern revolves around taxpayer-funded security, currently extended to a limited number of royals. This expense becomes more critical, especially considering the potential future roles of other family members, like Lady Louise, the Earl of Wessex, or Beatrice and Eugenie. Engaging with charities and organizations holds immense significance for the royals, as it amplifies awareness and support for causes that often struggle for attention. The impact of a royal visit goes beyond a mere handshake. It significantly boosts publicity, support, and donations for these lesser-known charities. Therefore, it's crucial to balance the role of the royal family members in such engagements while also addressing financial concerns regarding security costs. The recent interview that's garnered attention is the Spotlight Markle Clan interview. I haven't had the chance to watch it entirely due to being engrossed in my studies for the past few days. However, from the snippets I caught, it seems like the family is attempting to present their side of the story. There wasn't anything scandalous revealed, just the usual tactics for generating clickbait. Nonetheless, it's evident they're still striving to defend themselves. Many criticize them for accepting money for interviews, but given the initial harsh treatment by the media, I can understand their perspective. Harry and Meghan played a role in ostracizing them by excluding them from the wedding, which fueled the drama. Had Meghan's family attended, it might not have escalated as dramatically. If Meghan had engaged in dialogue with her father, it might have mitigated the situation. However, Meghan seemed to thrive in the midst of the resulting drama, leading people to assume her family was dreadful for not being invited to the wedding. In reality, Meghan may have deliberately stirred the pot, despite framing herself as a victim. It's within her rights to cut off ties with her father, but the public manner in which it was done suggests a desire for continued drama. It's crucial to remember that they didn't seek this attention. The media's sudden interest in the Markle family heightened after Meghan's decision not to invite them to the wedding. Regarding the speculation about Harry being a no-show, reports suggest he hasn't informed the palace about his plans, despite publicly stating he would attend. His lack of transparency seems childish. His potential long-haul flight for just a couple of hours, followed by a rush back for his son's birthday, appears impractical. There's a possibility he might change his mind last minute for dramatic effect. Shifting focus, let's touch on the Met Gala. 
Rumors abound that Megan was a no-show. Some reports claim she declined the invite last minute to avoid further attention. However, this seems dubious. I highly doubt she'd skip such an event if genuinely invited. Anna Wintour's respect for the Queen might have influenced the decision, as Meghan's presence might not align with Wintour's preferences. It's intriguing that even a cockroach made an appearance, further emphasizing Meghan's absence. In conclusion, I'll continue keeping track of royal news and will return soon with updates. Take care until then!